Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, Leah. Hello! <laughs> and hello, Internet, and welcome to Common Descent Live Chat. This is a brand new series that we are starting off now in the time of the great pandemic. From home to reach more people, give you some more stuff to enjoy. Following in the, the footsteps of the sloth chat that we did way, uh, back. Way, way back, we did a live chat about sloths. The goal here is that we are going to be inviting on guests, friends of ours, other scientists to discuss topics that we have covered previously on the podcast. So this one is about ancient DNA, which was the subject of episode 34. And our guest today is a name you will recognize if you remember that episode. Our friend, Dr. Leah Lynch. Leah, go ahead and please introduce yourself to everybody. Hi. All right. Uh, yeah, so I am uh, Leah Lynch. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Um, there I teach anatomy and I do research looking at the intraspecific variation of mustelids. So most of my research up to this point has looked at pine martens, which are adorable and fluffy and you must Google because they'll just, they'll just make you happy in their fluffiness. I, w I will um, concur. <laughs> Um, but I also, in doing that, work on ancient DNA, obviously, which is why I'm here. So. Right, right. And for a bit of background for our listeners, uh, Leah went to the same master's program mm -hmm. as Will and myself. So we've known each other since we were uh, graduate students. Yep. So the format of today is basically we're going to do a Q&A. We've got a couple of questions of our own to ask, mm -hmm. and then we've been collecting questions from our followers on social media. And as the program goes, anyone who is following us can feel free to go ahead and throw your question in the chat on the side of the screen, and we'll ask some of those as well. So, all right, that's it. Yep. We'll go until 8 o'clock, so we'll go for an hour, or until we run out of questions, we'll see what <laughs> comes first. So to get us started... Leah, before I go into the questions on the list, can you tell us a bit about what your ancient DNA research is? Sure. Um, so I've been predominantly working on one project for what it seems like is my whole life now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that kind of gives you some insight into how difficult sometimes working with ancient DNA can be um, and uh, the challenges that go along with it. Um, <clears throat> because I work on Pine Martins, my research was looking at historic and um, current populations, but also ex um, extinct populations. So I have been trying to get DNA out of of some fossils that are anywhere between like 22,000 and 8,000 years old. They come from a couple different cave deposits. Um, <clears throat> we've had the most luck with the younger specimens, so about the 8,000 year old specimens. Um, and the goal of that project is the morphology of these animals is different from the living populations that we see today. And because of that, it gets thrown around as, well, it must be its own species, or maybe it's just a different morphotype or whatever. So uh, myself and the colleagues that I work with up in Idaho have been trying to figure out genetically whether or not it is, in fact, its own species or whether it's a subspecies and kind of what we're looking at there. So that's where my ancient DNA background is coming from, is mostly training and working with that particular project. Okay. It's, cool. that, it sounds like a very cool project. Yes. Yeah, it is it is really neat. Um, and the specimens that we got to work with coming from these caves are beautiful. Um, we were very fortunate that they let us destroy some teeth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, we, made, we made casts of everything first. There you so, go. Um, yeah, good, there you good. go. But, Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start asking these questions. But before I do, as a refresher for everyone, can you remind us what the term ancient DNA means? Oh, yeah. So I actually had a very long conversation about that with a friend recently. And it, I think ancient DNA is kind of like, what is a fossil? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the conclusion we came to. Um, so when I work with ancient DNA, what I tend to think of it as is uh, specimens that were alive when we weren't necessarily like documenting or collecting them. 
um, if that makes any sense. So I tend to think of things that are historic as being something that we collected, put in museums, or we were actively, you know, running around with while we were documenting our own history. Um, <clears throat> but I have also heard that ancient DNA is referring to anything where you use ancient DNA methods on it. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, um, but it's something that um, in having this conversation with my friend that I learned as well. So um, that is how I would define it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I, like I said, I think I think it seems like it's become that what is a fossil, yeah. what is what is ancient. Right. So. Right. Well, it's, well I, I guess that makes sense because in our episode, if I, if I remember correctly, and you can correct me, uh, the sort of quintessential first ancient dna study is that quagga study mm -hmm. is that the famous uh, uh, that they extracted dna from a quagga which was like a hundred years old mm. which is a historical specimen specimen right yeah but gets <clears throat> lumped in with a lot of those ancient dna yeah. versus historical dna kind of studies yeah. and the reality of it is is that most of the time when you're working with historic specimens you are using ancient dna techniques yeah okay. so <clears throat> it, it that's just because the DNA is going to be degraded too. So, right, right, and it's it makes sense that there there can be a little bit of a a gray area between the tech techniques you're using defining it or the situation of the specimen defining yeah. it. Right, right. Yeah, that's like paleontology and archaeology. Yeah, it's like the methods are pretty <laughs> much the same. Well, it's it's if it's... I showed you a tool bag from the two. <laughs> It could be very likely that they'd look almost identical. Right. Ancient <clears throat> DNA Barbie looks the same as historical <laughs> DNA Barbie. <laughs> yes. yes. Both, both are on my desk, by the way. Okay, yeah, I, I would be disappointed <laughs> if they weren't. So let's start asking some of these uh, fan questions. Okay. We'll start with a few that are about the science of ancient DNA. So Jonathan asked on Facebook, what can we tell from reading ancient DNA? Can we learn details about appearance, uh, etc.? Yeah, um, so a lot of the ancient DNA studies focus on looking at the evolutionary relationships of animals, um, but also trying to understand the population history, um, trying to discern maybe why animals went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, for example, um, <clears throat> and trying to get an idea of whether or not those populations were in decline before humans came into North America, you know, things like that. Um, but there are studies right now, um, n not as much in the ancient DNA realm, but hopefully with the application there, um, of researchers who are looking at look specific genes and trying to figure out what they're coding for right um <clears throat> we had a guest speaker at uh, washu recently that was trying to discern which genes were controlling coat color in mice for example and different um behaviors um sociality or um you know, aggression things like that with then the goal of applying this back to historic and extinct populations <clears throat> so um that is definitely an avenue that we are trying to go down. And as ancient DNA research gets better, we're getting more and more genes out of these fossils. And so we are able to start making kind of those connections for sure. Yep. Very cool. I know I've seen studies of ancient human stuff mm -hmm. where they'll be like, here's what their eye color was and here's the hair right. color and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that is thanks to the people who were doing research in living populations yes. of mice and stuff in their lab and breeding for certain things and then looking for traits. So yeah, you, it's, you need to identify it in the, the modern when you can actually confirm that's what that gene is doing before you can, you can't just decode DNA right. without having, right. The gene doesn't say blue eyes. Exactly. <laughs> You have to know what that now, sequence wouldn't, means. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> Just like yeah. all the fossils had little labels on them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another question from Catherine uh, from our Patreon. Hey, thanks for being on Patreon. Uh, this is a, There's two questions here, and the first one is a, a real simple one, and the second one is going to be real fun. What is the oldest DNA that has ever been sequenced, and what do you think is the outer limit of sequencing in terms of age? <laughs> yeah. Um, so to my knowledge, the oldest DNA, not proteins, but DNA that has been sequenced was from a horse that was about 700,000 years old, which is still 
getting up there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that horse was very nicely permafrost preserved and in its nice little freezer packet and all <laughs> that, you know, um, <laughs> ideal situation there. Um, the, the thing about DNA degradation is that it is so sensitive to not only age, but the climate in which that animal and fossil then are preserved. So, um, cave deposits, they are not friends with DNA, unfortunately, because a lot of times they're really wet and kind of humid and, um, not particularly cold, like 50 degrees isn't really cold, you know? Um, so given all of that, um, I, I tend to be very skeptical that you could get anything past a million. I would really think that would be great. But having fought with things that are 8,000 years old for like six years now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And those were, you know, dry preserved in the desert. Um, I, I would love to get stuff older than that. But that million, I think, is where my brain is right now of that might be our extreme. But I don't know. I feel like we're finding new stuff every day. And the reality of it is, is that there's so many labs now working on ancient DNA and improving methods that we're getting more and more out of the extractions that we're doing that may allow us to get further back. So. Okay. Now, uh, for a terminology clarification, when we say sequenced, that means, like, determined the order, the sequence of at least a number of base pairs. Right, yeah, yeah, all your ATGC sequences, yeah. So I guess <clears throat> yeah. in th- that would be different, for example, from like identifying a, a chunk of DNA, like a, a a single nucleo base or something. Right. Would not be a yeah. sequence. <clears throat> yeah. Um, usually when I say, think of sequencing something, it's length of base pairs that's actually informative that you could do something with. Um, <clears throat> so really anything above one but once you get down into like you know under a thousand it's not particularly informative when you're trying to actually study it and compare it to other animals yeah i guess identifying dna is not a big deal yeah like this animal had dna well yeah Yeah. right (laughs) Uh, another earthling (laughs) yes so they belonged on this planet (laughs) So, and I see we just got a question uh, that that goes along with that one, so we can ask it now. Would you like to read that question Absolutely. since you can actually see the, the screen? Kale asks, what is the best conditions for preserving DNA? Mm. You want it to be dry, and you want it to be very cold. So, those are the ideal, ideal conditions. There was actually a study done... I want to say in like 2011 that put bone through various conditions, uh, different temperatures and humidity and things like that. And then sequenced or they did a qPCR, which basically tells you like the quantity of uh, DNA that you have um, and kind of in lifetime. Um, <clears throat> they did that on each of these bones and were able to determine, you know, like the half life of DNA given each one of those conditions. Um, and you want it to be nice and cold. That's the, that's the big key here, which is why we get so much cool information from those specimens that are permafrost preserved. Yeah. Okay. Also, Kale, I think, is another one of our patrons, so thumbs up <laughs> for patrons. Here's another question from the internet, uh, from Facebook. This is from Jonathan. How many extinct species, or what interesting extinct species, have we been able to completely sequence the genome? So most of these animals, we have the mitochondrial genome or we have mitochondrial DNA. We're getting more and more nuclear genes out of animals. Um, Those are a little bit trickier to get because they're not as high copy number, right? You have lots of mitochondria in your cells and so the likelihood of preservation is greater. Um, So I... I'm a little biased in that I study carnivorans, so I think the coolest ones are like the cave lions and the cave bears that we have <laughs> genomes for. Um, I, but I wouldn't a lot disagree. Of, <laughs> a lot of people um, work on like extinct horses, bison, um, uh, or aurochs or another one, um, the woolly rhino, uh, mammoths, obviously. Um, so we tend to target 
from DNA, these large kind of flashy Pleistocene um, animals. Um, part of that is because you're working with a large specimen and you need to start with a lot of bone tissue to get that little bit of DNA out of. Um, <clears throat> but also people care more about the big, you know, megafauna, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing that we've gotten more DNA out of are recently extinct species like uh, passenger pigeons, Tasmanian uh, tigers, things like that. So we have genomes of like complete genomes of those animals. Um, and they're, you know, actively trying to understand how to bring them back and things like that. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. so here's a question that I, I'm always a little unsure of when we, so in paleontology, oftentimes you will hear uh, people talk about complete skeletons. Mm -hmm. And usually when we say we have a complete skeleton of a thing, we mean, like, within a margin of error, we have pretty much the whole thing? Yeah. What does a complete genome mean? How how complete <laughs> is a complete genome, actually? So, they're usually probably comparable, where it's, you know, you're missing, like, a few base pairs here and there. Um, they're made complete in a few different ways. Um it's sometimes you end up sampling a bunch of different specimens and you get chunks of a genome from each one and then you kind of end up piecing all those together um, just depending on how the preservation was. The more recent studies though, you're getting full sequences of, you know, a, a whole individual. Um, <clears throat> usually when I do my sequencing, I'm missing like a few pieces at the end. Um, and there's some genes that are just a pain in the butt to sequence because they're just like a a a a a a t g a a a a a a a and things don't like to bind to that. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you end up fighting with that a little bit, but I I would say at least from my own readings and my own experience that it's it's comparable. Where you're you're probably missing a few things here and there. And the other difficulty is that sometimes you um, you don't have you don't know what that animal's genome is supposed to look like right you're you're assembling it de novo and so you're comparing it to the most closely related thing and so you may end up aligning it and thinking you are missing something when you may not be it may just not be in that animal but it is in its most you know um recent relative yeah so. okay interesting so a lot like the bones a lot like skeletons yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So I can just barely see the next question yeah. from all the way over here. <laughs> uh, and it looks like it's a very similar question to the next one on my list. So we can do okay. both. All right, cool. Um, this one's from Renee on Facebook, who's also a patron. And I think Catherine was a patron. A lot of these people are patrons. <laughs> Thanks to all of our patrons. <laughs> Renee asks, are there any particularly dramatic examples of DNA results that upended previous conclusions about taxonomy? Mm. And if you want to read yeah, out this one, Joshua asked a similar question, which was, "Have ancient DNA studies changed where we put things on the phylogenetic tree? If so, how often does this happen, and what specimens do you know of?" Okay, so I know that the big thing with genetics in general has been understanding cryptic species where morphologically they look exactly the same. You see this in a lot of birds and amphibians. Um, <clears throat> and so we, we end up with these distinct species that we have otherwise been lumping together. Um, I believe, uh, and don't quote me on this, um, but I believe this happened as well with bison in North America. Like you, we were differentiating between like um, step bison and the typical bison that we think of roaming North America today, um, the genetics of that ended up helping. Um, as far as like extreme like turnovers though, I can't think of any, I, I know that a lot of times the um, DNA ends up helping considerably in just trying to figure out where something falls. Um, so for example, I, I worked on Panthera atrox for my master's and I did morphological studies on it, um, looking at the phylogenetic placement of that. And shortly after publishing my paper, they did a genetic study on it. <laughs> um, and it did shift it. It, it. The genetics put it in a slightly different place than the morphological traits. So I think you probably end up seeing quite a few instances of that where it doesn't necessarily place it in like an entirely different genus by any means, but it 
you know, places it in slightly different sister taxa or something. So, so more refining the place, the placement or uh, arrangement than reorganizing. That's what I've mostly come into contact with. Um, and, and I think part of that may be because we get a lot of ancient DNA out of Pleistocene animals, which are pretty closely related to things that we have today and have a pretty, pretty good understanding of. Um, I imagine if we could get DNA out of things further back in time, we might be upending a lot more things than we necessarily are now. That makes right, right. that makes sense. Well, it, it seems to me like a lot of our taxonomic phylogenetic relationship refinement comes from modern DNA. Yeah. More than from ancient mm-hmm. DNA. Like a lot of the mm-hmm. weird, like Tamistima, you like to talk about yeah. the false gharial, mm-hmm. where the morphology says a thing and the DNA says a thing. Nice. The, the lizard family tree has been rearranged a number of times yeah. with different... But that's not ancient stuff that's working from the modern. Right. Uh, and another big kind of debate in phylogenetics in general is whether or not it makes sense to combine morphological and genetic traits into single phylogenetic studies. Mm-hmm. Um, how you weigh those. That's like... All, I. Literally, like, I had, like, eight lectures on that for one <laughs> class that I took, and just that debate. Um, and being the only paleontologist in the room, they're all like, well, you have to use genetics. I'm like, okay, well, what if you don't have that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's nice for you guys, but, um, yeah, so. Okay. Interesting. And also, before we move off of that, I want to let everyone know that Leah mentioned studying an animal called Panthera atrox, and in case anyone, for, for anyone out there who doesn't recognize the scientific name, that's the enormous american lion which is awesome which i think is important to note so that you know how cool our friend leah is (laughs) (laughs) Uh, speaking of understanding relationships michael on facebook also a patron asked how do you determine the time frame of a phylogenetic split using dna right yeah um everybody's asking all these questions that are like eight lectures long, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, or more. I've literally sat through entire symposia on this question. Right, right. Well, condense um, that so, entire symposium into a three-minute yes. response. <laughs> and um, okay, so if you were strictly using DNA, and that is it, then a lot of times what people will do is they will use the mutation rate of a particular gene. Um, and that's been studied in, you know, captive populations to understand how quickly certain genes will mutate. So some genes that are not under selection, um, will mutate pretty rapidly because there's nothing preventing them. There's no selection on proteins that are being created or whatever to keep them from doing that, which those genes are the ones that aren't particularly fun to sequence. Um, (laughs) so, um, Sometimes you'll see different rates depending on the gene or combination of genes that that people will apply. Um, I actually published a paper on this recently that was looking at comparing previous publications that had just used mutation rates versus using the fossil record to inform your tree as well. So my personal preference is that you should use the fossil record to inform your dating of genetic studies as much as you can Um, because it's informative Um, and not all genes are mutating consistently at this nice rate right they may have undergone different changes at different times and that rate may have shifted back and forth Um, so you kind of get two camps of people who think you can just go off the mutation rate and others that think that you should be phylogenetically informing it using the fossil record so, <clears throat> I'm in the fossil record camp. I'm a paleontologist. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> it's our podcast. Yeah. We continue our bias. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> our podcast discussions. Well, and that's uh, that sort of stuff's how you get the the molecular clocks that you'll see in reports yes. and stuff all the time. Exactly, exactly. So right now, when you're making phylogenies. Um, especially if you're running in like a Bayesian mode, for example, um, you can put in lots of things that we call priors. So these are informed decisions that you make that you think make sense to help guide that tree. The analysis doesn't necessarily have to listen to it. It's just like, (laughs) it gives it like a starting point in in like space and logic space to pull from. And then it'll go from there to figure out what is the best fit. So usually calibrating with fossils is one of those inputs that you put in. It's right, right. it's kind of interesting that it seems like there's a consistent uh, semi feud. Uh, that's probably too dramatic a term, but uh, 
dual siding on, on things for the fossil or morphology versus strict genetics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that seems like that's that pops up in different aspects of it. Uh, and that yep. is, I guess, my question really quick is: Do you think that's because it's that uh, ancient DNA studies is still relatively new, and so it's still figuring out how to mesh with everything, or is it just that there's contradictory data? So from my readings, I would say most ancient DNA studies are, I mean, they're done by paleontologists, so they do tend to be fossil informed. And it's the, it's the people who are studying extant populations that use just the genetic data and then try to extrapolate back. That, that seems to be where the conflict lies is between, that makes sense is between those two yeah yeah that makes very sense. interesting and and following along those similar lines aj on facebook asked also a patron <laughs> is there we have a lot of patrons everyone's a patron <laughs> i love you guys is there any way and uh, specifically at the human genome but in general as well that we can tell which segments of dna are older than others versus more recent mutations or additions yeah so the the idea here is it's kind of similar when you're looking at morphology you would expect things that are shared across multiple species like sequences that are consistent across multiple species to be older than those that are variable um and again that sometimes you have to look gene to gene and that'll be different depending on the mutation rates but um when you go through and you sequence a bunch of individuals for example you you line them up and then you can usually see like this section is highly variable, but this section is conserved all the way through. So usually you end up interpreting those conserved regions as being the older ones and the mutated ones as being new. Okay. That just, like you said, just like with skeletons. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I guess there's no marker on the bone or on the gene that is older. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have like dust. No, yeah, well, it doesn't <laughs> have dust <laughs> on it. Version 3.5 and. Oh, no. Right, right. Well, because it's refreshed every time. Yes. Every <laughs> uh, I do see that we have another question. You do. Which is a, this is a fun one. So Felix asks, if you could know the sequence of any ancient DNA from an animal in the past 700,000 years, what would it be? And we should note that Felix, if I remember our messages on Patreon uh, properly, is eight, Yes, I think. I think Felix is eight years old. Uh, Kale, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But yes, this is a child's <laughs> question, and it's a great question. Awesome. Ah, any animal that I would want to know. Um, well, right now I'd like to finish the project I was working on. <laughs> now. Um, Fair enough. But I think I think the really cool one would be like to get smiled on and stuff. Those animals are so hard because yeah, DNA doesn't really come out of La Brea. Um, so <clears throat> figuring out more about those guys especially if you can start tweaking out like coat color and the behaviors and stuff like that yeah that'd be really cool (laughs) have we do we have any saber tooth cat dna i'm if we do i'm blanking on it okay Uh, i've never heard of it either yeah i yeah i don't think i've just missed it but i i don't think so weird so something the yeah get on it la brea (laughs) (laughs) so moving on from questions about sort of the ancient dna itself we've got a couple questions about the methods that we use to study ancient dna this one comes from ligus or ligus or something on twitter how do you actually get ancient dna you often see a scientist take a piece of tooth and then voila dna (laughs) what are the steps in between (laughs) Uh, I really love watching those on TV shows where they just like take something and they put it in a machine and they're like, oh, and I know the whole genome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Simple as that. Like the forensic yeah. scientists where they're like, can you <laughs> test this for DNA? Yes, I'll be back in five minutes. Well, that's the, the <laughs> DNA version of the, the ground penetrating radar from Jurassic Park. Yes. <laughs> and exactly. they're Polaroid of your fossil. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if only. Um, yeah, so usually what we end up doing is you are taking a sample of bone or a tooth. Um, usually you work with what you have, but teeth are um, a little bit nicer, a little bit denser. You get more powder for your, more bang for your buck, if that makes sense. Um, 
you have to go through and clean those off. So you usually soak them in like a bleach mixture because you want to get all the bacteria that's on the outside, all of your fingerprints and junk off the outside of the bone as much as you can before you powder it. Um, <clears throat> then you put it to powder it, you put it in this really cool machine called a cryo mill. I just think this thing is awesome. You basically like put the tooth in a metal tube and you sh- push it down into liquid nitrogen and then you just shake the crap out of it. And then it's like instant powder. <laughs> It's great you because Mr. Freeze it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, because I, and I'm sure you guys, you know, having worked in the field, if you've tried powdering a tooth without doing that, there's a reason they fossilize so well because they don't like being powdered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you start by doing that, you powder it. Um, and then there's a series of ex- DNA extraction processes that you can go through. And this is one of the places in which a lot of people are constantly experimenting so that you can get just that little bit more. So I use phenol chloroform isoamyl usually to, um, to extract DNA. And then you actually uh, use to help bind it um, like a, a compound from bat guano. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just again like i'm always amazed by the people who are coming up with these methods i read the papers i try them out but i never feel like i'm confident to be like that that chemical seems like it would do it back on let's do that <laughs> um so once you extract the dna um you and you can go through and do a couple different ways to um increase the number of copies that you have of the DNA that's there and then end up sequencing it. So you have um, next generation sequencing, which is what most people are are doing now. Um, And then you also have Sanger sequencing. So Sanger sequencing is really great if you're saying, I just want to look at cytochrome B, for example. Like a specific... Um, Yeah, or a couple genes. Um, Sometimes people will use that for nuclear genes. Next gen sequencing is when you're getting like the big full genome sequencing and you're targeting everything that's in there. Um, so to to do that, then you create what's called a library. Um, and the library puts like a series of um, adapters and barcodes onto the DNA so that when you put it into the machine, it can read it. And it allows you what I think is really cool. Those, those barcodes basically allow you to pool a whole bunch of specimens into one um, into one run and then you can go back through and differentiate them because they were all labeled with a slightly different sequence basically um, and that, that that makes it sound like those were like the easiest steps ever but, <laughs> but that's, that's so cool <laughs> yeah um, for some of them um, for the steps I'm making the library you work with um, these tiny um, little magnetic beads so you actually make the DNA like magnetic and you bind it to these beads and then wash it off and um it's it's pretty involved but it's cool i enjoy the clearly as i'm getting excited yeah. i enjoy yeah. that work <laughs> That's, uh yeah. gaff said csi paleocene and yeah. <laughs> after all that yeah i have to agree that's awesome yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I mean, you, you joke about loving the lab work, but I imagine that if you didn't love the lab work, you wouldn't study ancient DNA. Yes. Yeah, because you have <laughs> a lot of times when it does not work. The The lab that I trained in for like modern methods, um, he kept a stuffed monkey on top of one of the PCR machines um, so that when your PCR didn't work, you would throw the monkey and not break the machine. <laughs> <laughs> that is very clever. <laughs> There you so, go. Thinking ahead. You yeah. need to have like a little Lego tower yeah. so that you can smash something without actually breaking yeah. anything important. Yes, exactly. So speaking of sequencing and, and methods, here's a question from Allison, which <laughs> is on Facebook, which sequences are best to look at when studying ancient DNA? So a lot of our ancient DNA studies started off with mitochondrial DNA. Um, mitochondrial DNA is higher in copy number. As I was saying before, you have a lot of mitochondria. Um, they tend to be preserved uh, or more likely to be preserved than the nuclear DNA. Um, they also tend to be, mitochondrial DNA also tends to be more informative when you're looking at like biogeographical studies and understanding how animals are moving around. Um, 
it, so you tend to see it a lot in, when um, population studies are trying to understand like where animals originated and things like that. Um, and that's just because of the way it, that it mutates. Um, it doesn't have the same, uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Um, uh, this is where I forget words. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't have the same protections in place as nuclear DNA does to prevent it from mutating. So like things like histones, it doesn't have those. Um, and so it's more likely to mutate and so sometimes you can get a little bit more information out of it based on those mutation rates okay. um that being said now that we're doing a lot of next gen studying most ancient dna studies have like the full mitochondrial genome and then they'll have a few nuclear genes in there as well very cool and so uh for people if you don't remember our episode discussion Every cell in your body has two sets of DNA, one in the nucleus, which is where your chromosomes are stored, and then your mitochondria, which you'll remember from biology class, is the powerhouse of the cell, mm -hmm. has its own DNA because it's actually a bacteria, but that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. And so each of your mitochondria has its own little packet of DNA, uh, which means that you have many times more copies of the mitochondrial DNA uh, than the nuclear DNA, because there are several per cell. Another methods question. This is from Sai Valimo on Twitter. Do the methods used to extract and analyze biomolecules from fossils differ from those used in other biochemical experiments? And then they uh, uh, relate it to isolating proteins during biochemistry mm. courses. So uh, when we're talking about biomolecules, ancient DNA would be an example of that. And then there's various types of proteins what kind of variety is there methods wise so i can't speak to protein stuff i have not worked on that personally um what i can tell you is that because you're working with bone and or tooth material and it's usually degraded you start with a lot more of the sample um, than you would if you were working with, say, soft tissue. So, for example, um, if you can get, like, 150 milligrams of a tooth or bone when you're working with ancient DNA, it puts you in a good place. When I work with soft tissue, 25 milligrams is, like, excessive. Um, <clears throat> and so you want to start with as much sample as you possibly can, and that helps you so that as you're going through and you're doing your extraction and your libraries and all of that, you're working with as much DNA as you could possibly get out of there as possible. Um, and you tend to do um, more amplification runs, if that makes sense. So you, you, you get your DNA, you extract it, you make that library or you, know, you adapt your uh, primers to it or whatever. And then you would amplify it. So you just make it run through and copy itself over and over again. You tend to run those cycles more frequently with ancient DNA than you would necessarily have to with extant because you're working with so much more DNA to start with. Um, okay. <clears throat> does that kind of answer that? <laughs> what Sounds looking good for, to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got a question about mitochondrial you DNA. Did. It was Ian asked, why is mitochondrial DNA more recalcitrant? So it's not quite obvious on their end. Recalcitrant is a word that means stubborn and uncooperative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I don't know that I would say it's more stubborn. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that I would say that. Um, I mean, it can be a little bit more difficult if you're looking at... Um, genes like the control region or D-loop, they're um, synonymous. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because it, it's not being selected on. There's nothing that's preventing it from mutating. And that's the gene that's just the AAAATGC repeat 8,000 times. <laughs> um, so, that, I mean, that could be one reason why it's a little bit more difficult to work with. But other genes that are within the mitochondria, like Cytochrome B, 16S, 12S, they're much more conserved and they are being selected on. Um, and so they're not as difficult to work with. Here we okay. go. Ian clarifies, uh, why is it that you can find it uh, in fossils 
or more easily find it, I assume, in fossils versus the nuclear DNA? Like, what's what's making the mitochondria stick it out oh, I see. more than the nuclear uh, DNA? Stubborn in the face of yes. fossilization. Yes. Gotcha. Got um, because you have so many of them is really what it is. The numbers um, game. The numbers game. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. The, the reason we have so many turtles in our gray fossil site <laughs> pond yes. sediment. As a <laughs> <laughs> Not tur- well, I get a uh, uh, pond turtles versus bo- uh, ground turtles. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a couple of questions about genetics, more general. Okay. Uh, these are from Michael on Facebook. The first is: Can the genes of two unrelated organisms mutate to appear similar by chance? So we've talked on the podcast a bunch about how you can get convergence mm-hmm. of physical, you know, bone structure and things where mm-hmm. two different groups evolve wings or whatever. Can you get convergent genotypes? So I think in theory you can, right? Because all of these are going to be coding for proteins. Those are all being selected for, and there's only so many combinations you can get to get those proteins. So I think from that perspective, yeah, you can. Um the other way that you can see that is through horizontal gene transfer, um, right. which is basically where you have <laughs> like other animals sometimes contributing to the genome of maybe two distant really related animals. So like if a virus or bacteria injects its DNA into those two distantly related animals, you would suddenly have this section that would be similar. Um, those... Those are the two ways I can think or would you would see that most commonly. Um, and, and plants do all sorts of weird things. So they c- duplicate their genomes and copy those over. <laughs> and so I'm sure there's something in plant land that would be very similar along those lines. That's just outside my realm of knowledge. That actually uh, sets us up for a nice chat question. Uh, Eric asks, uh, said, may have discussed it but uh what is the state on fossil plant dna uh is that something mm. that is being looked at if you know yeah you're, you're which yeah. you are like us you are a vertebrate person yeah 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 <laughs> um i believe it is i would be shocked if it wasn't um but i that's not the literature that i'm usually in so yeah. i don't know yeah and like i said plants are weird they're confusing <laughs> <laughs> I respect people who study viruses and plants, man, because I I wouldn't even know where to start. Because they're bizarre. That's why we have a yeah. plant friend mm-hmm. who comes on the yeah, podcast good. to talk about plants. All right, they're all right. Very strange. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to direct that question at Allie. <laughs> we'll see. I wonder yeah. if Allie would know these. Yeah. Uh, Arik yeah. has asked if you have any cool info or stories but about plant DNA, but we'll we'll see if Allie knows anything about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, this uh, Michael's second question is sort of plant related (laughs) in that it is uh, related to domestication Mm. so this question is so so basically the the question is pointing out that with domesticated species like dog breeds or crops you can get a lot of physical differences within genetically very similar Mm -hmm. populations whereas in the wild you can see very different looking things that are uh, genetically are very genetically different that look physically similar so his Mm -hmm. example is chimps and bonobos are different species even though they look very similar so the question is 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 that a phenomenon of domestication that you can get a lot of physical difference with uh, with relatively little genetic change so it's definitely something that we in domesticating those animals have honed in on but it's something that is has the potential to be present in every species so this is literally what i study Mm -hmm. so i look at intraspecific variation in mustelids and whether or not that correlates to variation in their environment in their behaviors um things like that so um a lot of my research has focused on the variation that's present in the limb morphology of pine martens and how that correlates with the amount of snowfall that they're encountering across their geographic ranges or rainfall or whether or not that differs whether they're living in a coniferous forest versus a broadleaf forest um and it does um so you you do see these 
maybe not the extremes that we see in domestication, but you do see these degrees of variation um, across species just in how they're behaving and um, living in different environments across their ranges. Um, so species that live in a wide geographic range, you can think of like raccoons, for example, um, that you find across all of North America, deer, um, you do see these variations um, as they adapt to their local environment. Okay. Makes Very sense. interesting. It's an interesting thought. Mm-hmm. I, it always is incredible to me how much genetic change can seem disconnected from physical change. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very interesting. Yeah. We have a question from Finn, uh, which is, can sequencing ancient DNA from extinct animals tell us anything new about their living relatives? Ooh. Right? That's a good yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah. So I think it definitely gives insight into the way and maybe timing in which the um, extant populations or species evolved. Um, For my own research, I tend to use them um, to inform the way in which something evolved, maybe whether or not it was correlated with um, glacial cycles or um, changes in biome and things like that. So if you can get information on an extinct species and how that then can inform your phylogeny, you can do a lot from there looking at morphological traits and um, things like that. Yeah. Cool. It's it's basically, that's like the whole field of phylogenetic comparative methods right there. So you hear <laughs> yeah. people talk about that. It's using that phylogeny and the more information you have in that phylogeny, including extinct taxa, then the more informative you can get on how morphological traits were evolving. Yeah, well, it's uh, once again adding that that context of something that may have seemed new or old can be revealed in its timing more, which is right, right. right. That's really interesting. And I remember seeing a a study that came out not too long ago. I think this was on passenger pigeons hmm. and or the Carolina parakeet. It was one of those. It's something that we killed recently, <laughs> <laughs> and it was looking at their genetic variation on the as you approached extinction Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the researchers were saying that based on how the extinction happened we will be able to see signatures in their dna so for example if they were very limited very small populations on the decline for a while you'd get a lot of uh interbreeding and a lot of repeated traits and that can then help us recognize patterns looking toward the extinct the possible extinctions of living species yeah yeah and people have done that with the megafaunal extinctions too there have been studies looking at that population decline as well so it's definitely something we're extending further back than just what we recently killed off cool well uh we now go into a section that i think is a required section for (laughs) any discussion about ancient dna (laughs) All right, all right. Uh, and we will start with a question from Instagram from the Dino Man, which is, is it possible to Jurassic Park the DNA? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just put, like, frog DNA in it, right? And yeah, that's fine. how it works, right? <laughs> yeah, frog DNA yeah. is, like, what, what is it, O positive? Yeah, yeah. Universal donor, <laughs> you just put the frog yeah, DNA in anything? exactly, and then just poof, <laughs> you have a mammoth, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and then actually, I'll, I'll slap a few of these questions together, because Jonathan on Facebook also asked, what are your views on resurrecting and reintroducing recently ex- extinct species? We talked about de-extinction. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then Davidus on Instagram asked, when will we finally get our Pleistocene park? <laughs> <laughs> so the there's definitely been talk of projects of bringing back mammoths and trying to figure out how, you know, would you put it into a female elephant and how would you grow the embryo and things like that. And as we get these like full genomes of animals, like that's becoming more and more plausible and um, uh, definitely not something I'm working on. (laughs) Um, But I 
my personal opinion is if it went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene because of climate change, we should probably let it stay there because um, we're not getting colder. <laughs> it's not the Ice Age anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think a mammoth or a holy rhino would be particularly happy right now. Um, but I am a big um, advocate of studies like the Passenger Pigeon Project or Tasmanian Tigers, um, where we clearly played a role in that. Um, and they held a very important niche within, you know, their ecosystems and trying, if we can, to bring them back. Um, but I also recognize at the same time that we should be putting just as equal efforts into preventing what we still have from dying right, right. um and I, there was a um I can't, I can't remember which group did it but there's a big project now to um like the two million genome project or something like that to just go through and sequence every animal we possibly can so that we have that on record and we can do projects like this and bringing things back if we have to or you know having more understanding of um, keeping them from going extinct in the first place. So, but I would really love a Smilodon or Panthera atrox. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, right. The big, the big uh, obstacle we'll have to get over is that Smilodon and Panthera atrox lived in a very specific part of the world, and yeah. the, the people that live there don't have animals like that anymore. <laughs> nope. So, no. can we convince no. uh, the annual visitors to Yellowstone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Extent? You would like this giant lion chasing you because yep. oh, you know. Uh, and they thought convincing people to let wolves back into right. the area was tough. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just throw some dire wolves in there, too, while you're at it, you know? Big deal. On the subject of dinosaurs, because mm -hmm. Jurassic Park was mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, there was a recent study that we mentioned in one of the more recent episodes of the podcast that uh, uh, reported on potential evidence of DNA in Cretaceous dinosaur remains. Right. And so yeah. Charles on Twitter asks, what's your take on potential <laughs> DNA evidence in Cretaceous hydrosaur remains? So my starting point is usually I am highly skeptical um, because it's, I, from my own experience of just struggling with things that are 8,000 years old. Um, but I will say, having looked through that paper, a lot of it is uh, histological staining. Um, and they use that to understand, you know, what is actually there. Um, and the accuracy of those stains and, you know, what they're typically used for, or um, it, that's just outside of my wheelhouse. So while I, I think it's cool, I, I come into it pretty skeptical, um, but I can't, like, judge it accurately, I feel like, because... I don't know enough about the error rate in some of those tests that they ran um, to say one way or the other that I would definitely believe it or meh. so. So if you have a histologist coming on. Yeah, 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 let's see if we can find one. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's one of the, the tricks whenever there's a new sort of field of study is that in the early days there it's such a specialized field mm -hmm. that you end up with a fairly limited range of people qualified to comment on it. Yeah. Right. And so right. even someone as specialized as yourself, like you are doing ancient DNA, but this is a rather different method. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they, they're not sequencing anything. They're not, you know, pulling it out. And, and, and something that you have to consider too, is that if, if it stains, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's informative. Like you could have like one base pair just chilling there left and you can't do anything with that <laughs> it'll stain still um but it's then useless after that um so it they maybe they're seeing something like that i really i don't know right. but i i would like to see more along these lines and i and i know that that field of using like histo um, chemical analyses is becoming pretty big um so so we'll see what happens cool yeah we do have a couple new questions in chat, one yes, of which um, I, I'm i sure you can answer, and the other one uh, is much more uh, interesting. So the first one is from Thomas, and it says, is there a lot of work in single-celled ancient DNA? Uh, do they have any good way of isolating DNA from the same species for such something so small? Ooh. I haven't 
didn't run across anything. I feel like, given that you have to start, at least in my stuff, with, like, an entire tooth, mm -hmm. that you just wouldn't have enough to start with. But I don't want to be incorrectly talking there, but I don't do single-cell stuff, so... Right, right. I guess if you found, like, a chunk of algae, yeah. like a whole little... Like a, like a stromatolite. Yeah, like, yeah a bacterial yeah. match. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can tell you that the single cell friends are really good at invading things that I'm trying to sequence. And... <laughs> oh yeah, you you sequence single cell things all the time. I'm I sure. sequence them all the time, <laughs> um, so they're in there. But uh, what they're probably not um, ancient. They're probably you know whatever was running through it when it got buried. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which makes sense. Yeah. The other question is. From Michael, who says, is there anything that ancient DNA can tell us about the soft tissues of extinct organisms? Many animals get shrink-wrapped in recreations, which is when, for everyone else out there, that's when you draw a fossil animal with the skin up against the bones instead of, a, you know, uh, giving room for fat and stuff like that. And they were wondering if ancient DNA could remedy this problem in any way. Um, I think it kind of goes along the lines of what we were talking about earlier, where we're we're learning enough now to know what these genes are actually doing and controlling for, and what variation in them is telling us. Um, so I think we're getting there. Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, and then, I mean, you guys just had uh, Mauricio Anton talking a lot about how they're doing the reconstructions by looking at muscle attachment sites and stuff like that. So I feel like the combination of those two studies and better understanding um, soft tissue just in general in extant animals is is kind of key to yeah. that. Good cool. questions from the chat today. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, I've got a couple more on my list to ask. One more on my list and then one more surprise from another source. <laughs> Both of which are about humans. So keeping okay. in mind, of course, that, Leah, you do not study ancient humans. I know. I work with a bunch of anthropologists. I am not an anthropologist. <laughs> I thought you were about to say you work with a lot of humans. but I some, mean, I do that too. Some of my best friends are humans. You haven't studied them. <laughs> Melanie on Twitter asks... Why don't we see Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in living human populations? Okay. Um, so mitochondrial DNA is passed on strictly from the mother. Um, so you don't inherit mitochondrial DNA from both parents like you do nuclear. It's just from the mother. So from what I have read... Um, the idea there is that we don't see it because there's either so little of it that it to start with like when we had neanderthal human um, breeding that it has since been kind of washed out and we've lost it or the idea of being there when you have a neanderthal mother and a um human father that the offspring weren't viable uh, and so you would have not seen that combination because yeah, mitochondrial are, dna is just passed along from the mother's side. From the mother, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, um, so those are kind of the hypotheses that I've seen thrown around in my little bit of <laughs> human DNA searching. That makes sense. Interesting. Uh, we had another question from Lydia, which is a more complicated uh, human evolution question, uh, which was asking about what different species from the past have been found to contribute to the genome of modern humans. Mm -hmm. And I know at least that Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA is known to be found within modern humans. Yeah. And I think that's it. That's it's, all I know off I the top of my head. I think that's all we've sequenced in the fossil record. Yeah. As, to... as far as I'm aware, yeah. So. And we just got a question on Facebook during this chat. Which reminded me that uh, we didn't say, hey, social media, mm -hmm. but uh, somebody did anyway. Um, this is from Jennifer, and this is a question about our discussion on the, the episode, episode 34. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that I, I think I could answer, but I'll throw it to Leah and see if you can answer. Okay. Uh, why did we say in our episode that Denisovans are mostly known from the DNA? Why was that sequenced without having more fossil remains? 
Oh, I'm going to actually pull this from what you were talking about. Isn't that we just, we had like one sample, right? Mm -hmm. And until recently, we just really didn't have the morphological. So we recognized a genetic variant within that clearly represented some sort of population or species, but there was nothing to tie it back to. Yeah, for, for people, for anyone who doesn't remember this story, the Denisovans are this ancient group of humans, homo something or other, that is very close to us and Neanderthals. Actually, they're sister group to Neanderthals, and then we're next to them, which are known from a handful, like a literal handful, <laughs> of finger bones, and I think a tooth, and I think recently there was a, a couple pieces of skull and jaw. Right. And that's it. So the reason we haven't sequenced more from fossils is because we don't have fossils. Mm -hmm. We've got chunks, and so they don't even have a species name because there's no morphological you know. features to define it with. Well, it's the, it's the opposite situation of what we were talking about beforehand, where uh, you you tip you know there's lots of times where you only have the morphology and you can't really get to the DNA. This is the opposite situation. <laughs> we don't have enough to use the morphology, so they use DNA. Yeah. Which is cool. And with that, it is 8 o'clock. Uh, did we just get a new question in the chat? No, they were just confirming. Gab was saying the DNA was from a tooth of the Denisovans. For Denisovans. Uh, or was asking Ask, yes. if that was from a tooth. The original one was a, a pinky bone, I think. And then I think that there have been a couple other finger bones and or teeth. Um, go to youtube.com slash scishow. And search for Denisovans, because I, I wrote an episode for a <laughs> show about Denisovans, so go get information from there. <laughs> uh, thank you to everybody for asking mm -hmm. all these wonderful questions for people yeah, in the thanks, chat. Guys. And yeah. for people on our social media. And a huge thanks to Leah. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a thank lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Good. So, hopefully everybody has enjoyed this. If there's more that you want to hear from Leah, her Twitter handle is right there on the screen. So you, it's right <laughs> there on the screen. <laughs> so you can follow Leah for more cool science-y, ancient dna -y type stuff. Uh, as always, if you want to hear more of this kind of stuff from us, send us a request and we'll put it in an episode. Like I said at the beginning, this chat, this live chat is a series that we are starting now. We have several more planned out, so you will hear it here first. Next week, same day, same time, we will be having a live chat about turtles Yep. with our friend, all three of our friend, uh, <laughs> Dr. Steve Jasinski, who is our sort of our, our turtle expert among yes. our graduate uh, class when we were there. <laughs> so... Once again, thank you to everybody for joining us. Stay tuned for more, and we'll see you next week for more stuff. Absolutely. Cool, mm -hmm. and I'm doing an official sign-off for the recording so that Will can s click stop recording. Yeah. There we go. Wonderful. People are saying they love turtles. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Steve that. No, no, no. We're going we're gonna to grill them. Good. Good. <laughs> it's